Pierre Boulez has been conducting the BBC Symphony Orchestra for more than 40 years. Through the testimony of musicians, colleagues and listeners, and through archival material, we can try to assess how this partnership has changed perceptions of the music of our time. Let's begin with Boulez conducting the orchestra back in 1967. People who are really creative want to communicate. They don't want just to, you know, to discover for themselves. That's not true. Creativity is a form of generosity. The future is only to act in the present and not at all to think always of the past and the, the things which could have been done. You do things. The invitation to become a regular feature of British musical life came from William Glock. In the 1960s, he was the BBC's controller of music. When asked, he said that his policy was to give people what they will like tomorrow. I chose very precisely the things where I could work according, not to my taste only, but to my ideology and that people were on the same wavelength uh, than me. And they helped me quite a lot. As I mean, uh, just to, to, to give the example of London, I learned, for instance, to make programs with William Gluck. We were two opposites in a way. I mean, he, he, he was a theorist and a thinker, and I just tried one thing after another. But um, he, he listened to me if I thought that something perhaps was overdoing it, and I listened to him if he could convince me that I was being half-hearted. Boulez arrived with the reputation of being a leading composer of post-war European music. The personality revealed in the music was complex, radically new, and quite ferociously uncompromising. For some people, Boulez was cast as a kind of avenging angel who was going to cut a swathe yes. through music. <laughs> It was like John Peel said about hearing Elvis the first time, it was, the world was never the same again. They used to have a, a, a little cloud chamber in the Science Museum where gamma rays came through the building and hit, and you see these little spirals and kicking off in all directions and crisscrossing each other. And that, I mean, Buddhist music very much reminds me of that because you know there is, it, it looks unpredictable, it looks and can, at times random, but it does make the pattern, and it does make it, it, it is a the, an exemplification of a profound order. In 1964, he gave his first concert at the Festival Hall, and they were a revelation. The music was realised from from within, so to speak. Boulez's ear was fabulous. I mean, it was as though he were attached by a hundred invisible threads to every member of the orchestra. He was a perfectionist to start with. Everything had to be right. You couldn't get away with sloppy playing or anything like that. That really, I am not a great friend of sloppy performances. He would know every note in the orchestra of the instruments, especially in his music, and he would give you that cue as safely as anything. You'd never doubt him. He couldn't make a mistake. I can remember Al Alfred Flotinsky, do you remember? Oh. Uh, Boulez stopped and he said, Alfred, what note do you have there? And Alfred said, 
B? And he said, but you played a C. And Alfred said, just checking. <laughs> and he said, Alfred, you do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he was very demanding of the yes. players, setting a very high standard. But at the same time, his patience seemed unending. Tchaikovsky once said, you know, the difficulty uh, to learn really the métier of conductor is to know the places which will always go wrong if you don't work on them, and the place, even if they are wrong at the beginning, where always go right, which were always, uh, will be always right, uh, even without rehearsing them. And that's true. I, I personally enjoyed his rehearsals almost as much as the concerts. He had a wonderful way of uh, clarifying even the most complex and difficult scores. Twice Solia, twice Solia, wait for me. Huh? Huh? Just, you are, you are always too much in a hurry. You, you make me silly, yeah? so we're too soon, too soon, too soon, too soon. Wait, wait, wait. You cannot really decide completely about a rehearsal before beginning. Of course, you know very well, as I say, the spots which will be more difficult, uh, which will need some work to be done. But I mean, you cannot know exactly, because especially if you are in front of an orchestra, 110 people, you know, um, different types of soloists, different types of reaction, different of type of nervous reaction even. And you know, they give you something also, especially if, if it is a work which is part of the repertoire, even in the contemporary repertoire. You know the reactions, more or less, and you react to that. And for instance, if he, he goes too quick, uh, you cannot know exactly the, uh, how quick he will go, you know. So you are listening, and I say, no, I want that calmer. I don't, uh, you know, I don't use many words in rehearsal myself. I think that's wasted time, because if you are doing sentences and sentences, you are sure that after 10 seconds, nobody listens to you. Can we take uh, figure one, please? The horn still. One, two, three. A flat, C natural, yeah? D, uh, B natural, I mean. One, two, three. Yeah, and the G, yes. You know, the three, there are three tones, I want to have them, three. One. Two, three. No, you, you, are, you, don't, you don't begin together. Can we do that again? One, two. One, two, three. One, two, three. One. I don't think it necessarily changed no, no. the attitudes of the players, because after all, they could still be very resistant. Yes. But if they needed technical yeah. guidance, Boulez would be able to provide an efficient grid of beats or yes, that's right. uh, some other kind of assistance to get them through. I would think uh, a composer has a different way of approaching music. I know in Boulez rehearsals he has a particular way of taking the score to bits and will ask for extraordinary combinations of instruments to play together. Uh, and I suppose that's the way that often that scores are written. They aren't there all at once. You add them in layers, and that's how Boulez seems to hear them. One felt that the varnish had been scrubbed off the old, and yet the new had been revealed as in every way as valid.
The key thing about Boulez's style as a conductor is clarity. I always had the feeling that we'd never heard some of these works before. He brought to it this impeccable technique, and of course that was very extraordinary, working without a baton. We weren't used to that, and this absolute sort of rigid technique. And yet he brought to it a kind of analytical clarity, which was not academic at all or pedantic. He just seemed to get to the essence of the music. Pierre Boulez has always believed that music can be explained. Through the medium of television documentary and by using graphic diagrams, the complexities of 20th century music could be taken apart. The aim was to discover, reveal, and render the new more comprehensible. The composition is based on a superposition or synthesis or a fight of themes. With television you could do, uh, and you could give explanations, that you could never do uh, normally. Uh, for instance, I remember also, I mean, uh, there was a kind of transposition. We did uh, once uh, with Barry Gavin, uh, small a part of the workshop on the Bartok music for strings, uh, percussion and celesta. And uh, the first movement is a fugue, uh, which begins with the violas in the middle. was very striking to see this kind of enlargement of the screen and you did not to, to explain anymore because people saw exactly what was going on. programs that Boulez did, and I remember a particular one about the Bartok strings, percussion and celesta music, him describing the form of the first movement, just showing on the screen the sort of envelope of, of the parts. And um, I, I hadn't ever had any explanations of music that were that simple and compelling. Music was often moved out of its traditional concert hall setting. New locations were found, like the Roundhouse in North London, there, a young, informal and adventurous audience could experience at close quarters music at its most extreme and even bizarre. place was inviting for this type of experiment and then also we got a certain type of audience and I think also, I mean uh, in a big city uh, you know you think a big city is one entity that's not true at all you have really different parts in a city and I think as an institution you have to go directly to these different parts and that was my strategy and with William Glock when I was uh, uh, at the BBC at first. 
He certainly encouraged me personally, for instance, in the work that I wrote for the Proms in 1971, which was, um, it was a kind of music theatre piece done in the Roundhouse, um, with audience participation to a certain extent. And he was very much for that and encouraged that. The arena. Hail, gladiators all. Monsieur Boulez is at the stand, maestro furioso of orchestral karate. Because it was the BBC, it gave a certain cachet to the performances, which they wouldn't have had if it had been a, a visiting conductor. They wouldn't have, it, it was a national institution that was then committing itself yes, that's right. to that kind of clarity, mm. that kind of wisdom. The BBC gave him a chance to try out all kinds of things, and it went on, and of course everybody eventually benefited. It was incredibly big time, incredibly big time, and it was a really momentous time not just for the orchestra, but especially for percussion. Everything was alive, and it wasn't a monument, it wasn't a national treasure, it was, it was something that was vital and part of you. When he began to conduct, of course, more and more frequently in London, um, then uh, that, as I said, was a complete musical education for me, and, and tremendously revelatory. It opened up everybody's ears because you could actually hear this very complex difficult music, given beautiful performances, so the music could speak for itself rather than struggle for itself. I suppose I might have thought the music very odd, but there's something about the way that Boulez presented everything which was both very alluring, but also very solid. You felt that you were in good hands, that this was really the thing that you were meant to be listening to. But just to watch, just watch Boulez conduct Fabian, with the, the clarity of his beat, absolutely ties it all together. Our music communicates, but what it communicates, that's very uh, impossible to say. And uh, you know that uh, Proust once said that when he writes the novel, the novel is written by the reader. And you see that people, when they read a novel, you know, make their own world out of it. And I think that the same thing with music. You give this object, musical object, and then people are having their imagination working of it. This kind of, in the same time, 
global communication is made of many tiny individual communications. Well, that's like an image of the brain, finally. You know, you have a, a single brain and thousands and thousands and billions of connections. And I think between a, a, a piece which is performed and a piece which is heard, you have also billions of connections which are impossible to describe. It was just a complete door opening that on, on a, a kind of sound world which uh, I'd never heard before. I thought it was just immensely seductive. I feel very close to the idea that I would like listeners really to follow music closely in, in formal terms and to recognise as much as they can, to train themselves as listeners. So I felt very sympathetic, I suppose, to Boulez's way of, of really organising these performances so that it, you could hear what was going on very clearly. For me, I mean, there is a, a musical form I like very much, that's the form of the spiral. You have seen certainly the Guggenheim Museum in New York, and then the Guggenheim Museum is, you know, a spiral going up. And when you have uh, exhibitions uh, there, painting exhibitions, uh, you have um, small boxes, let's say, uh, but you are back to the main stair, and you have a box, and then another box, and so on, and you go up like that. But when you are going to the central stair, then you see what you have seen back, and you look at what you will see. And you have this conjunction of where you are, where you were, and where you will be. this contemporary music, you know. There's a, the kind of reaction which is, we just not take in consideration even the proportion of what you do. But you are, as a type, you are cast like that. And whatever you do, you will be always cast like the man who represents contemporary music. I am not uh, uh, ashamed of that, on the contrary. He was uh, clear in what he would not do always, and quite interestingly flexible in what he would do. And Pierissimo. In the Boulez years, the sense of adventure stretched from the newest of the new back to the founding works of the 20th century. The clarity, eloquence and commitment reached out to young audiences and to young musicians on the threshold of their careers. Well, the excitement, tremendous, you know, kind of uh, intellectual excitement and uh, just a, a good well feeling of well-being, I think, and what it was to do with the music and music making. discovering a, a, a world and I think that's something that's I am very happy myself to participate in such a, a discovery because I say I think 
Well, I was, maybe they will remember this occasion during all their life. And that will, will be their discovery of Schoenberg or their discovery of Stravinsky. And if I go back to myself, you know, this freshness you have, this spontaneity you have, of course, after that, you cannot reconquer it, or you have to fight to keep something like that. Pierre brought to it a kind of freshness and a kind of discipline, intellectual discipline, which was very exciting. And it's, he's never lost that for me. I think Poulos becomes a kind of reference point, um, which, is the which is the legacy, and that has to change over the years. Whether things have changed for the better, I find it hard to say that they have, because to a certain extent I think we've slumped back into Brideshead revisited kind of culture, um, which is perhaps what a lot of people prefer, but whether that's right or not, it's a, di it's a different matter. After all, you can always find what you need in a culture. I did not want to change the world. I mean, I am pragmatic enough to, to know that, but I want to show that it was possible at least to give a model of it.